Yu-Gi-Oh! Duelist of the Roses is a PlayStation 2 game released in 2001, early on in the PlayStation 2's history. What distinguishes Duelist of the Roses from other Yu-Gi-Oh! games is its completely different game mechanics and weird British history theming. But let's look at those weird game mechanics. Cards get summoned onto a 7x7 board and slowly move around according to movement allowance. The goal of this game is to attack your opponent's duel masters enough, do enough battle damage to decrease your opponent's life points to zero, or surround the opponent's duel master. All in all, the system is a bit of a hybrid between Yu-Gi-Oh and chess, as you still get to draw a hand of cards every turn, and what cards you get access to is determined by what's in your deck. There are a ton of interesting nuances to this system that elevate it into something more interesting. For example, every card, be it monster, spell, or trap, is placed face down on the field before it gets to be activated or moved. This means there's always an element of mystery and risk to every interaction on the field. There's also different types of terrain that either boost or hurt monsters depending on the type. Unfortunately, terrain is a tad bit overpowered, but I'll get into that in a bit. So the game's main campaign is split into two different routes. One following Yugi, pretending to be Henry Tudor, and one following Seto Kaiba, pretending to be Christian Rosencruz. The game's plot is loosely based on the 15th century British War of the Roses. It's never a smooth merging of modern Yu-Gi-Oh characters into the 15th century England, but the aesthetic does strangely grow on you. Unfortunately, I can't say the same thing for what the choices between the two routes actually do. All it is is just a different set of battles given to the player, with a minimal impactful higher difficulty curve on Kaiba's side. The choice doesn't really impact the story that much, but for the sake of the review, I'll start on Yugi's side. After telling Kaiba to screw off, Yugi tells us that we need to go around and collect the eight rose cards to force the Lancastrians out of England. This is our excuse to go around beating all of England in card games. We're given a choice of starter deck. I pick by far the worst starter deck in the game and we're off. The game starts off with a choice to fight either Rex or Weevil. We have to beat all of them eventually, so let's just pick Rex. The portraits and theme of this game is just silly. I break out into laughter every time Joey says, I'm Christopher Erswick. I still don't know why they went with the English history theme, but it just adds to the insane vibes this game gives off. Rex's map is covered in wasteland, so we get our first taste of the field mechanic. His dinosaur monsters are given extra movement and a 500 attack point boost, but more dramatically, it decreases water monsters by 500 points. So if you choose a water structure deck, you'll have to run through this fight quite a few times to get lucky enough to win. We can also see how labyrinth tiles, which cannot be moved through by regular monsters, create a very scuffed choke point gameplay. I managed to win this fight by sneaking a warrior to attack Rex directly, and after the fight we're met with a slot machine. By using the slot machine, we get whatever cards we happen to land on. The cards on the machine are determined by what cards our opponent puts into their graveyard. You won't realize it yet, but this is the only practical way to get cards in a playthrough. Konami's nature as a gambling company strikes again. I managed to sneak a win on the Weevil as well, but this is where the problems in our run hit us full force. Our structure deck just doesn't have the numbers to win against other decks. We also don't have a single interruption in our deck. But if you'll remember, the main way to get cards is through a slot machine, which we only get for beating players. This means we can only get the weak starting cards offered by Rex and Weevil. But more importantly, we can't get disruption or removal through trap cards. Let's look at the other methods of obtaining the cards. There are three other methods. Trading with other players, card codes, and reincarnation. The first method, trading with other players, is very self-explanatory, but it's kind of cheating, as we would need another game save data or a friend we could borrow cards from. The second method is also cheating. Card codes are codes you can input into the system for a variety of free cards to add to your account. You're given only two different ones for beating the game, and the rest I believe were given out of either promotional magazines or found in cheat code books. If we abuse the codes, we could create a deck immediately that would be unbeatable by any of the AI, who however would count this as cheating as well. That just leads us to the third method of obtaining cards, reincarnation. Every five games, win or lose, we can get rid of one card to randomly obtain three cards of similar value. This method for obtaining cards is extremely time consuming. Even if you spam surrenders to meet the game requirements quicker, the random nature of what you get makes this incredibly tedious. It's super unfortunate that quite a few powerful cards are locked into this mechanic. Unfortunately, with no better options in my run, I had to resort to this to get the ball rolling. Eventually, I managed to grind out some removal cards with reincarnation, as well as discover a decent fusion with a dinosaur and warrior monster. I say discover here because this game has no way to tell what you're fusioning into. The system encourages you to randomly mash cards together until you discover something that works. But even once you discover a fusion, there's no way to tell which attributes of cards you used actually trigger the fusion. Look at Nekogal number two. If you guess that this monster uses a beast warrior type and a female monster type, you're better than me. Oh yeah, that's a thing in this game, female types. It's the reason there's a list of female monsters on the wiki. But back to fusions. The whole system is just needlessly obscured and just ends up hurting the experience as early game. You have no clue what your plays will even do. Also, some fusions will just not work despite meeting requirements due to glitches and poor coding in the game. 
A few structure decks like Maiden of the Aqua have this issue, and it can deeply confuse a player why they can't make Kairu Shin with the correct materials. Well, once we do actually figure out our strategy, the game starts to get pretty fun. At this point, I actually get the progress through the game. Most fights will be decided by abusing choke points on the map and using the few removal spells to take out the opponent's big problematic monsters. Here, the game mechanic of everything being played face down really starts to shine. Attacking into a face down card is always a risk. If it's a big monster, you'll lose your investment into the card attacking into it. But if it's a small monster that attacks you, you can waste a powerful removal trap card. The system rewards a player for understanding the AI's moves. If the card is switched to the defense position by the AI, it likely has less attack than nearby monsters. If the card is placed near the AI and not moved or shifted, it's a spell or trap card. If the card is always moving towards a player, it's a decently sized monster. These tendencies of the AI are really cool to discover as the game progresses, and it reminds me a lot of countering the AI in games like Fire Emblem. However, after a certain point in the game, the enemy stops being able to throw out new challenges at you. The game's approach to difficulty is just bigger numbers and never unique strategies or effects. Early and mid-game fights like Pegasus and Richard III are fun because they come at the correct scaling point of the game, where a player only has some of the tools and knowledge at their disposal. This lets the player handle the opponent's massive numbers, but still not completely blow out the AI. Because a player early on will only have a few options to out the big monsters our opponent will make, and the player has to think strategically, and they will be rewarded for doing so. The point is, later on, the stupidity and predictability of the AI hard caps the difficulty and late game playability of the game. But I'll go more into that later. Right now, I'm just going to mention how amazing the animations are for this game. All 853 cards have unique 3D models and animations, regardless of how minor or major the cards might be. Some highlights include Moon Envoy, who has a full moon drop animation to just Majora's Max someone. This animation is on a bad 1100 attack normal monster, by the way. Throughout the game, there are a ridiculous number of monsters that attack through epileptic seizures. Like, geez, this is pretty bad. And lastly, Kazuhijin, whose animation did not age so well. The backgrounds are equally impressive, from Fire Emblem to a drug trip and to the Windows 95 background. Man, they just turned up the exposure a lot on this one. There's so much variety to what you see in this game. It's clear that the majority of this game's budget went to the animations. Unfortunately, I think this was to the detriment of the rest of the game. There's a rumor that Sony pushed the game developers to make the graphics as impressive as possible to show off what the PS2 was capable of, as this game was releasing soon after the initial release of the PS2. There's a lot of just wasted animations for bad monsters, and it makes me wish more cards had worthwhile effects, or even really just effects. There's a lot of normal monsters in this game that will never get used. So one thing that kept happening throughout my playthrough was surrender stalling out the AI opponents. What I mean by this is there has a condition where it'll fall into a position where it doesn't see a valid form of attack and will just not move or play a card. This is an exploit as the state is extremely easy to accidentally fall into because the AI isn't really given access to removal options. So it's a very valid strategy to just make a wall and block off the opponent's access points to your duel master and and just wait out the 99 turns after playing a life gain and burn spell and win by default. I did this to beat the Labyrinth Master and Rex at one point. It's so easy to trigger, I beat Yugi on Kaiba's route accidentally by using this method. When his AI just decided to not attack me even though I was losing badly. Let's get back to the story mode of the game. After defeating Richard III in a duel, yet yeah, this one's just Richard III, it's not Joey in a costume, it's actually just Richard III. Yugi invades England in a single JPEG. You then get to fight Kaiba for all the marbles. Once you do beat Kaiba at the end of Yugi's round, you get to fight Manawadan Fablier. <coughs> Manawadin Fablier, who's the secret final boss. This boss's difficulty comes from crush card squares in the center of the field and access to cards you don't have that are extremely unfair. Such as Rio Roku, which results in an almost instant OTK by halving your life points and adding it to the attack of a monster. Or Just Desserts, which is the best burn card in the game, and it's on a spell card. However, a simple field spell takes away half of this guy's pressure by removing all the crush card tiles. Once we beat Lier, we're treated to an ending where we're stuck in Tudor England. Yay. After wrapping up Yugi's route, we're taking the Kaiba's route. The story has just been to fight each of the Tudor allies in a straight line. We're giving back our deck from the last run, so we can just breeze through this entire route. There's not really any challenge in the second run of this game, as it doesn't escalate difficulty at all. This is one of the biggest problems with the game. It's the complete lack of progression after the first initial, initial difficulty bump. Taking into account just one of the two sides, this game is only two to four hours long, and adding in the other half would just bring it about five hours. This is where the game would benefit from either a modern game design knowledge, or at least a redistributing of resources during development. While of course the animation for this game are wonderful, I find myself skipping them or turning them off completely after a certain point in the game when you've seen all of them already. 
The budget of this game should have been spent instead on improving the enemy AI and increasing late game content. In my playthrough, I was able to surrender stall my opponent four times on three different levels. Even outside of that exploit, sometimes the AI just won't play correctly or has no strategy. Look at Yugi's grandpa, who's the worst designed fight in the game. You'd assume with all his stall cards that his deck master, he'd be trying to Exodia with you. Well, you'd never notice it, because the pieces of Exodia are always at the bottom of his deck. This fight only exists to stall out the player and pad out the game's runtime. Maybe it's fortunate, because if he could actually play Exodia correctly, thanks to the map, grandpa could win before the player could even get to him. This fight is also double unfortunate, because it reminds the player of how cool it would be to get Exodia. Here's a reminder, you can only get Exodia by reincarnation, by reincarnating specific cards and getting lucky, or getting a specific three of in a row in the slot machine. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, a lot of cards in this game just don't show up as options on the slot machine. In fact, there's 45 cards you just flat out can't obtain. They have full animations and range from broken to just confusing. More importantly, however, is how insanely difficult it is to obtain some cards, such as Dark Magician Girl, who again requires you get another three of in a row on a slot machine. Specifically, you have to get three Dark Magician in a row. Have fun with that. Once we do meet Manoladen Fablier for the second time at the end of Kaiba's route, we're told Kaiba's side would lose the war anyway, but we get to hang out with Seto Kaiba back in modern times. Also, we unlock free travel between both of the routes and free play. Both of the endings feel very unsatisfying, kind of like there should be a third route with a post-game level that really ups the difficulty. Instead, you've already gone through all the content in the game. Map design is the primary source of most of the difficulty in the game due to how incompetent the AI is. Enemies have to rely on terrain, giving their monsters bigger numbers, or crush card terrain to limit how your monsters can move. A single terrain manipulation card can solo most duels. At this point, near the end of the game, where your deck will have several terrain manipulation and removal cards, the only thing the game can throw at you to stop you is the instant OTK cards the two final bosses will throw out. It's unfortunate because the lack of difficulty completely takes out the motivation to collect all of the cards and try out different strategies from cleaning up the AI, I'd like to imagine this game's potential as a modern roguelike, where the enemy AI was improved and could make use of actual strategies. If a method of obtaining cards was added outside of the slot machine, like a, just a basic shop system, it could go a long way to aiding the player and being able to try out other strategies. My pitch for a sequel to this game would be featuring either Jaden or Yusei taking place during the French Revolution or the Napoleonic Wars. With an updated card pool, the Duelist of the Roses system could be an amazingly fun experience. Adding in modern online and the game would have long-lasting appeal. Before we move on, Apparently there are three extra duels you can unlock if you have a PS1 memory card with Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories save data in it. Now, I don't have a copy of Forbidden Memories, but I wanted to mention this so I can question why the game didn't just straight up add these duels as content to the main game. It really could have used it. The soundtrack for this game is extremely good. However, it's also extremely short. For most of the campaign outside of the few boss fights like Madeleine Fablieu, Yugi, and Kaiba, you're going to be hearing two one-minute loops. The loops are very good, and during Kaiba's route, I really hope you like listening to Elizabethan Trap, because that's the only song for most of the campaign. Outside of that, most of the game's music tracks are misplaced to be during the game's already skippable story, instead of in duels where the player will spend most of their time. Like most of the game, the music has a lot of potential, but it's either neglected or misallocated. It's not an issue unless you plan on playing the game for longer than 5-6 hours. Oh my god, hold on, I almost forgot about a mechanic. So your deck leader, your deck master, where you play all your cards from, they can level up to get special abilities. It's pretty crazy. These special abilities actually get us another way to unlock cards, which are the hidden tile mechanics. If your deck master is one of the like 7 that have the ability to learn the hidden card skill, if you move your deck master over a certain square on certain battles, you unlock a special hidden card. But the other abilities your most deck leaders can learn do anything like giving your units extra movement, gaining life points every turn, maybe doing a bit of burn damage, making your monsters just default bigger. This is one of the ways they actually gave difficulty to some of the other fights throughout the game. You wouldn't notice any of this unless you actually played for an insane amount of time. It takes about like 5, 5 to 15 games to even level up once. And there are like 7 levels where you actually fully level up your guy. To give you a context for how long this takes, in my playthrough where I grinded this game so I could beat my friend in multiplayer, I have 60 games played. My deck master is only level 5. This is because in the system for leveling up your monster, XP is given by how many monsters a copy of that monster attacks over or how many times they just remain on the field and move around. 
However, you can also lose XP if the boss monster dies. This means that if your deck master can't actually be a played card, it's almost impossible to level him up. So this mechanic with so many cool ideas, possibilities for deck building, and special hidden cards will never be seen by a regular player. Because even if you rig the custom duel mode to just turbo level up your character, it still takes about six hours. I had a friend who did this. It's insane. Speaking of multiplayer, I bet you're wondering at this point, how's the multiplayer in the game? It's interesting to say the least. It is extremely unbalanced with a very high number of staple cards. It honestly reminds me a lot of GOAT format Yu-Gi-Oh. There are a ton of valid strategies, my favorite of which is Burn, because since we're only at 4,000 life points, the opponent can be consistently killed by looping Tremendous Fire four times. There's three ways to reuse a spell card from the graveyard, and Solomon's Law Book makes the strat consistent. Making my friend upset at their complete inability to do anything, it's kind of fun. Unfortunately, even with the large number of valid strategies, a lot of multiplayer is determined by the map. If you want a more balanced experience, you can try limiting yourselves to a deck cost, but that's kind of broken as well. <laughs> Solomon's Law Book is a better pot of greed, and it can be used to draw five cards. I personally had a very fun time with this game on my first playthrough with a friend, but this game has extremely low replay value, and the mechanical issues become greater and greater as you play the game. There's bad decision after questionable game design after exploitable mechanics. As I progressed through the game, I initially got very excited to learn the game and how it works, and see all the beautiful animations. But later into the game, I got more upset at how mishandled the game is. There is a sense of old Yu-Gi-Oh nostalgia throughout the game, and it gives way more life than it deserves. The only animations are peak PS2 charm, and the game system is unique and full of potential. But it all covers up an otherwise very mediocre or even subpar Yu-Gi-Oh game. I would, however, recommend this game, provided you can get it for $20 or less on PS2. You could go and emulate it, but it's very fun to sit down and play it with another friend on PS2, and that's where a lot of my enjoyment from the game came from. Well, that and laughing at how incompetent the AI is, or how insane some of the animations can be. I'd give this game a 5 out of 10, being a game worth the little time that it asks, but it will just trip and fall if you try to make it run a marathon. I've left the most in-depth FAQ in the description to help you guys who want to give this game a try. Thanks for watching. I've been working on this game review for a while now. Who knew it would be hard to stream directly from a PS2? Speaking of which, you can check out my full playthrough of this game on a secondary channel, Monkey Fright Extra. That's where I'm putting higher quality versions of old streams and wacky content that just don't fit in with the main channel. Of course, you can also check me out live on Twitch. In any case, I'll see you guys next time.